Bienvenue now, one and all. Welcome back to Café Penumbra, your cyber café where we exchange ideas about current events, hot topics, storytelling, plus all the things. Please do visit us and interact on our sister platform, the Café Penumbra Discord server. See the link in the show notes or at seraphimpenumbra.com. Today we're discussing homesteading, urban, off-grid, or otherwise. But first, things that make you go, hmm. This isn't really inspirational, but I went to the doctor today, whose practice is especially for trans people and trans health issues, and that is a milestone. I feel so grateful to finally have this kind of care. And today was the very first visit, so there was definitely a lot to unpack. But one of the things that we discussed was the possibility of getting tested for ADHD and autism, which were not related to trans health issues, I thought. But if you spend any time on social media, posts about being introverted, having social anxiety, ADHD, maybe it's just my feed, but it does feel as though these maladies are almost being marketed to me. And as I explained to my doctor this one time, uh, I was working at a con in Southern California and I met this boy and we spent most of our free time together. And one night he suggested that we take some Adderall to stay up all night and party. And I was into it. So we took it. And I have to tell you, like 45 minutes into it, I was just like, I don't think I can remember being more sober and normal than I feel right now. And that makes me really angry. But it also did kind of make me think, maybe I have some undiagnosed stuff like going on. And I definitely remember in, in the 80s and the 90s, like being on ADHD drugs was like trending for sure. Who's to say that there was actually an increase in the symptoms or an increase a new awareness, a new di- you know, a new awareness for the diagnosis. I mean, I'm definitely not a hypochondriac who reads every single thing and says, "Oh, I have that." But I did have a lot of the symptoms, and I did resonate with whenever I read those articles, specifically for ADHD. I'm being precious when I use that word "symptom," because I genuinely do not understand where the line is between a symptom and personality, like an idiosyncrasy maybe. And with regard to autism, I've always joked that I feel like my family was the original inspiration for the flowers in the attic. Not because there are a a number of diagnoses along the spectrum in different branches of the family. I had assumed or thought or maybe thought I read somewhere that it was not genetic, but it did seem to be prevalent in my bloodline. So i wanted to explore. And I I definitely do feel like autism is something that they're still learning a lot about it. I mean, it's now called aut- autism spectrum disorder. It is something that has seems to be more prevalent. And it does make you wonder, is is it a new thing that's happening? Or is it simply new to our awareness? I have a nephew that I was speaking with who is autistic and usually nonverbal. He was about 10 years old at the time, and we were speaking about comic books. And when I'm speaking with someone that I don't know very well, I try and find some common ground. And I was into hero comics, mutants who were social outcasts with special powers, which has obviously become a kajillion dollar franchise. But we talked about superhero comics turned into movies. And his father reprimanded him for obsessing, which he was perceiving as a symptom, right? And I'm thinking, I finally found a connection point. (laughs) And that was very uncomfortable for me because, like I said, I couldn't find where that line existed, especially when I knew that his father had at least at least $10,000 worth of comics in his collection as an adult. And besides, what 10-year-old doesn't want to talk to an adult about something that's relevant to their own experience, right? Like maybe the reason they aren't very talkative is because they aren't interested in what we're talking about. I definitely know plenty of adults that don't want to talk about the things that I want to talk about, but here's the thing. I'm I'm not drug-seeking, and I'm fully aware that most of the treatments for ADHD is pharmaceuticals, um, and that it wasn't something um, that I... W- th- 
what was at the root of my search was truly deeper understanding. Do the things that chafe me do so because I am afflicted or because I am eccentric? So we're having, I was having this discussion with the doctor and he really surprised me with his response. He kind of wanted to know what I would do with the diagnosis. And I said, I really don't want to go down that path of experimenting with drugs to see if I have a malady. So if that were part of it, I wouldn't pursue it any further. But then he said, well, he wasn't being very direct, so I had to kind of weed it out of him. But apparently, trans people are disproportionately being diagnosed with ADHD and autism. And the problem with the diagnosis is that it creates messaging that the problem is within the person and not within the environment. So maybe a lot of trans people are trauma survivors and have been masking since before they knew what masking was. And I kind of feel like a lot of people learn to mask and then as adults, they don't recognize it because it's just something that has almost seemed to be innate. I don't know. I did really feel like I was reading between the lines and I asked for a reference or like a direction, like point me to some information on that. And he basically said, Google. And I was like, you really aren't allowed to have this conversation with me or something. It was, it was weird. So I did pull up a number of articles confirming the disproportionate diagnoses. And to be honest, I'm still juggling a lot of things. So I haven't finished reading or exhausting that research. I don't, I don't think I could exhaust the research. Uh, but in the conversation, we were pressed for time. We had a lot of things to discuss. I do feel truly grateful that I found him. I just didn't know that there was going to be homework. I'm kidding. I remember reading a book in maybe 1996, 1997, by a woman who was diagnosed bipolar and she articulated her experience in a way that I felt like if I have some disorder or situation, I want to be cognizant of why I'm experiencing the things that I'm experiencing in the moment and be able to create tools for coping. And I had felt like my personal anxiety was in check for a while, but here lately, well, most of you wouldn't know this, but I tend to isolate. And I have always joked that I'm a closeted introvert, but I was never joking. But you you all know that I'm a performer and I used to bartend and I was good at talking to strangers. In that context, the context was defined, however. And also I learned certainly in a number of different arenas, but certainly in the hospitality that if you're an introvert, that's fine. When you're at work, pretend to be an extrovert to make the money. So it was exhausting, but, you know, that was how I, you know, part of how I was successful in hospitality, despite being um, a self-proclaimed introvert. Of course, when I started isolating, I didn't call it isolating. I called it minding my own business. But whenever COVID came around, I was like, I'm sorry, we're supposed to stay home, not interact, social distancing. Say no more. I'm in. I'm about this. And apparently um, it's come to my attention that shelter in place has ended. And I'm like, I'm good. I mean, a person can do a lot from online. I'm just saying. But apparently it's unhealthy. So I'm not sure how I feel about it. Although it has occurred to me that when I die, no one will know. So I do need to move someplace where I can get a dog. Although if I die, who will feed the dog? I need one of those bracelets that will page the morgue. When I die, there must be an app for that. Anyway, I'm curious to know, does any of you listening have a link to an article or some factual information, not just specific to the disproportionate diagnoses in the trans and non-binary community, but even something speculative where somebody is creating an analysis and saying, what does that mean? Because my impression from the doctor was, it is not good for the cause to be counted as both of those things. And I would like to know why. Part of me wonders if it isn't related to the wave of this anti-LGBTQIA legislation that we talked about a couple of episodes ago. Like if all these trans people are autistic and ADHD, maybe their transness is also a, is also a symptom instead of just how they are. 
You may not think that that had anything to do with today's episode, but you're in for a surprise. Homesteading, urban, off-grid or otherwise, and you'd be wrong. You'd probably also be surprised, unless you really know me, that I would love nothing more than to get a piece of land in a very remote area and uh, have solar panels, grow my own food, can it, keep bees, have people join me there to share an off-grid summer camp fantasy lifestyle. Maybe someday. When you hear homesteading, you might think about preppers, feverishly stockpiling ammunition and military-grade RTEs, and you wouldn't necessarily be wrong. Um, And I think that, like most things, you're going to find a lot of overlapping communities, right? Homesteading is ultimately about self-sufficiency, and that's part of where that particular overlap occurs. The reality is that for most Americans, that ideal is radically out of reach, just on the logistics. If we look at a map of the United States by population, the greatest number of people live in urban areas, no surprise, where most of the food, fuel, and water supply is becoming cost prohibitive to be moved into the cities where the populace lies. In several ways, it's about a bigger story. That's about the damage that we're doing to our planet by our way of life in our quest for the biggest piece of the pie. I'd like to think that we're seeing more people returning to the old ways, becoming stewards of what's left of our planet in an attempt to ensure its survival. Quite possibly due to the recent and current COVID pandemic, we did start to see people turning to alternative resources to provide the basics for their families. It's very much a first world problem to experience food insecurity for most of us, and to experience supply chain issues that led to empty shelves, well, it did not bring out the best of us. But if we look at the headlines for the past few decades, we see all kinds of messaging about organic foods and sustainable resources and better health and living by eliminating processed foods from our diets. It hasn't been that many generations. Some of our grandparents, mine did, grew up on farms and canned food for the winter, had extensive pantries filled with non-perishable foods. I remember countless times my grandmother telling me the story about how they built, there was a window in their kitchen and they built a box outside of the window into which they would put their things that they wanted to refrigerate. Obviously that was seasonal, but that's how they did it until the, the advent of ice being delivered on a truck. And now I see more and more YouTube videos of countless homesteaders doing exactly this, living in more rural places, growing a good amount, if not all of their own food, trading with farmers for things that they don't or can't raise on their own. It wasn't that long ago that a really good quality dozen eggs was five bucks, and that was a little bit hard to take. But the difference in quality was unimaginable. And now you'd be lucky to find a dozen grocery store eggs, and I for sure can't afford the good ones anymore. Having a few hens in the backyard is starting to sound pretty good, isn't it? I remember when I first moved to New York City, I had an apartment in the cuts of Bushwick. And one of my neighbors had chickens, and we had a blackberry tree in the backyard. Yes, I did have to climb down the fire escape to get to the blackberry bush. But that was actually a legitimate food source of mine. And I remember being super impressed that these neighbors of mine were raising chickens in New York City. But it was certainly unheard of anymore. But most people who live in New York City can't have chickens. But I did enjoy the number of community gardens dotting the concrete jungle, brimming with green beans and tomatoes. Certainly wasn't going to feed everyone. But do you know how much a tomato costs in New York? And not even a good one, but those kind of plasticky orange ones that have no flavor. I used to think that I didn't like tomatoes, but I came to learn I just didn't like those fake orange ones. And of course, farmer's markets generally offer better produce, but that's another separate trip. And honestly, it's not as affordable as it used to be. When I was out in California, I finally had some outdoor space at my living situation, and I... um, (laughs) it was really bad quality dirt. So I excavated it and threw it in the garbage and replaced it with manure and organic matter and soil and amendments. And I grew so many tomatoes that I actually started a small business. I made piccalilli and made jam for my friends. And that was 
That was fun. And then for a while after that, I moved to Massachusetts and I lived with my grandparents who lived on what remained of a farm that had been in my family since 1901. And I rebuilt all the garden beds and produced more tomatoes. I started everything from seed and I just couldn't bear to thin them. So I would transplant them. And then I would have so many plants that I just would go out and dig a new bed to accommodate the plants that I had. And I just had so much abundance at harvest time. At the end of the first season, I had invested in seeds, soil amendment, fencing materials, fertilizers, canning supplies, and water, which ideally would have been from a well. But I remember the discussion was about whether it was worth it for what I spent versus what we saved in groceries. And that is a very good point. But we did give away plenty of food and canned a lot. It was very difficult to come up with an actual number. But for me, whatever the number was, that was the wrong question. The question was, did all of my labor in the gardens radically help my anxiety and mental health? Was the quality of the food that we produced superior to what was available on the market? What exactly was the price that you could attach to the peace of mind knowing where our food came from? Also, I kept organic, which meant that I wasn't putting poison in our food, but also into the environment, you know, to harm the bees. And So how do I come up with a price tag for contributing to a good pollinator environment? So family structure, there's part of this homesteading ideals that originates when both parents are, you know, this, you know, quote, traditional American nuclear family where you have two parents generally not earning an income outside of the home. So handling all of that agriculture and caring for those animals and doing the canning and all of those things were an integral part of their lives, but they also didn't need to leave for 40 hours a week to do it. So we're seeing like these systemic breakdowns happening. And I feel like that's part of what, you know, brought us to, you know, the quick ready to eat food culture and the prepared foods and processed foods. And a lot of it has to do with the way that we live changed while the model stayed the same. For example, the model is geared for this demographic of this nuclear family where the person who stays home and cares for the children But today, in most instances, people can't afford to have someone stay at home. So we saw how women took on careers, but still had all the responsibilities of caring for the home. And so we saw how capitalism marketed those products at us based on saving time in the kitchen and space saving, uh, time saving devices and appliances and gadgets and saving time in the laundry room by selling processed foods that, like as we have said, ultimately aren't the healthiest choices, but usually more affordable, ironically. Everything is still being marketed to families, though. Like, when are we going to start seeing more homes being built with multiple master suites? And why is it disproportionately expensive, more disproportionately more expensive to have cell service if you aren't on a family plan? And I just hate that they call it that even. You, I, at one point recently, you could get free Disney Plus or free Hulu or free uh, Netflix, maybe, if you were enrolled in a family plan. And I just kind of felt like, so you're discriminating against me because I don't have a multitude of people who all need to buy your service. Can you just call it like a group plan? I just feel like because I don't have a family, I'm being left out and I have to pay more. And it just seems backward to me. I don't have a need for more than one phone, but I'm kind of being taxed for being single. And on that point, homesteading really would be out of reach for me as a single person of a certain age, which is part of why I'm so interested in the idea of building communities where that can happen. A new kind of chosen nuclear family, but where everyone has their own domicile. Unless it was a family, of course. But with like a communal kitchen and dining areas and a library and a yoga studio and a subterranean year-round greenhouse, obviously gardens and chickens and bees and all those things. I do remember hearing that there's a link between gluten sensitivity and GMOs. I just wanted to touch on that for a quick second. It totally makes sense, doesn't it? Like the way that they're manufacturing and manipulating our food has made it so that it's not really healthy, nutritious food for us anymore. 
But when I did research that, I kind of found out that for the most part, that has been debunked. Um, But if you look at the bigger picture, you can see as the American family lifestyle change, products were brought onto the market that replaced most of the foodstuffs that homesteaders had been self-creating off the top of my head, things like pancake mix. My grandmother would look at you like you had three heads. Part of the idea behind homesteading is keeping pantry staples that can be broadly cross-utilized. So in other words, why on earth would you need to buy pancake mix when you have oil and flour and baking powder and an egg and however it is that you make pancakes? Those are all basic ingredients. So why do you need to buy a separate pancake mix or a cake mix? (laughs) A lot of these convenience food come at the basic cost of not knowing what's in them, not being able to pronounce it. And in many cases, they are sodium and preservatives that you wouldn't include in your diet. And do we even know, has there been testing on whether or not we should be consuming whatever it is that they're putting in there so that the food isn't not safe to eat? Generally speaking, when I go to the grocery store, anything that says mix, unless it's a spring mix, I just don't get it because it's I don't need it or it's something that I can make with ingredients that I already have at home. But even something as simple as shredded cheese is treated with something. I don't, I don't recall what it is, but to keep it from clumping together, which then makes it melt strangely. So I don't buy shredded cheese. I have a grater and I, yeah, that's just weird. I see mixes for things like country gravy and I'm like, there's only, or Alfredo sauce mix or taco seasoning. And I'm just like, you don't need to buy a mix for that. Like, I don't know if it's clever or if people buy those things, but I'm just like, I just find that insane. Crepe mix. It's eggs and flour. Come on. I personally currently live in a city. I feel like I've mentioned that before, so I really can't grow any of my own food. But I am excited that I have. But I am excited that I have some hydroponic herbs. Um, like I started out with basil, and that makes me pretty happy. And I've managed to keep them alive. So I'm definitely considering them more as a food source because I have better luck with keeping those things alive than anything that is considered a plant. And I know that it's exactly the same thing. But if I grow something as a plant, it will die. And if I grow something, well, I should say indoors. I can grow, I can grow plants outdoors um, and food. But house plants, it, I just can't do it. I don't know why. Which, I, I, just to contradict myself as a true Pisces, I do have a cactus that I received as a gift for appearing as a panelist. And I've managed to keep that alive, but it's, it doesn't require much of my attention. And I think that that's really why. So all of these convenience foods are meant to save time. And I get it. Everybody has to decide what level of, of convenience, you know, is, is works for your family or your group or whatever it is. Like currently, I don't bake my own bread, but when I do buy bread, I get it from the bakery instead of from a plastic bag on the grocery shelf because I don't know what the commercial bakeries are putting in their bread or how old it is. There are just too many degrees of separation for me personally. One really cool concept that's been around for a while but may be new to some of you is um, Community Supported Agriculture or CSAs. And there are so many benefits to joining these. Obviously, the fresh, most of the time, organic produce. But it's kind of like a co-op in the way that you buy into the program, which helps the grower, in turn, to plan and determine the quantities of crops. So it becomes more efficient than setting up at a farmer's market and kind of rolling the dice on what will sell. And then you have to transport it and keep it, you know, from spoiling I also wanted to mention, at least this is dated, it was probably at least 20 years ago, I read about grants that were available for beekeeping in cities, which I thought was incredibly progressive at the time. But we were already starting to hear about how the pollinators were on the watch list for endangerment. But I just mentioned it because there still are grants available for that, not exclusively federal funding, 
But I love to hear about ways you can live in an urban environment and still be mindful of your carbon footprint and participate in a greener life. When I was talking about living in California, that was in Oakland. In, uh, was it Emeryville? It was Oakland, um, which is a city. I mean, not a New York City city, but I had like a little piece of not even a 16th of an acre. But it was enough to put some dirt in and grow some tomatoes, you know. Obviously, everyone can't move to a homestead and grow all their own food. And if that were one extreme, I would just want to focus, as usual, on all the shadow that exists in those gray areas. I would love to hear from you if you live in a city and what ways you have found to cultivate urban homesteading. And if you're in a rural place and you already are homesteading, share your stories. As always, let's keep the conversation alive. And remember, it's only a conversation when ideas are exchanged. So please do head over to our Discord and weigh in. Next time, who are you really? A look into genealogy and DNA testing. Thanks for stopping by Cafe Penumbra. I'm your host, Sarah from Penumbra, wishing you a jolly new now. Thank you.